this was a great vote. It's a 50-50 situation, a perfect scenario for the debate uh, that will follow. I will take the standpoint of uh, definitive chemo radiation, and I have to disclose that I have a conflict of interest. And this conflict of interest is that I have to fight against David Ilson, <laughs> because when I was a young, when I was a young fellow coming from Munich to the Sloan Kettering, there was David Ilson having his clinic with Manjit Baines, with one of the best uh, esophageal surgeons. And I really learned from him so many things how to treat esophageal cancer that it's now paradox that I have to take the counter standpoint. But you will see in the Sloan Kettering, they see different patients from what we usually see in Europe and in normal centers. And this makes it probably easy for me to convince you that definitive chemoradiation is also an option. And I show you here one of the typical patients. It's a 50-year-old female patient in this case with a T3N plus M0 squamous cell cancer of the esophagus, 10 centimeter length in the middle part of the esophagus. We or they gave her cisplatin 5 few and 60 gray as a definitive treatment. Then some months later, she had recurrence or tumor persistence in the esophageal wall within something that was called a radiogenic stenosis. And this was diagnosed with repeat bite-on-bite -bite biopsies. You see on the pictures this very localized relapse. And uh, I want to discuss with you now in the next 10 minutes, was the decision for definitive chemoradiation right in this person? And then we will go on to some other questions. And according to the ESMO guidelines that we published in 2016, you can see that for squamous cell cancer of the esophagus, we have two recommendations. So your vote 50-50 was quite well taken, and you have all read the ESMO recommendations. And there is one track that goes into new adjuvant chemoradiotherapy, followed by restaging and surgery. And there is another track uh, that recommends definitive chemoradiation. And why did we recommend definitive chemoradiation with the same a level of recommendation as surgery because there are two randomized controlled trials, one in France, one in Germany, that showed that the addition of surgery to chemoradiotherapy did not improve survival outcomes. In France, this was shown to responders to neoadjuvant chemoradiation. If they were responders, they were randomized and they did not gain a survival advantage by the addition of surgery. And the design of the German study was a little bit different, but basically showed the same, no significant improvement in overall survival by the addition of surgery. So this is a very strong point that definitive chemoradiation is a recommendable treatment option, even more when you go to the mortality rates, which were around 10% in the French trial when you go to 90-day mortality and 12.8% when you go to treatment-related mortality in the German trial in the surgery arm. And if you say now these are old studies may be done in smaller centers. This is different now. I will convince you with the next slide that this is not the case because this here is data from Scandinavia from a study that was done in Sweden and in Denmark published last year in the Annals of Oncology and still the 90-day mortality rate was 8%, and in the Netherlands, they looked at patients who were treated according to the CROSS protocol, which is new adjuvant chemoradiation followed by surgery, and they looked at those patients who had extended eligibility criteria, like a little bit more sick, the tumors are a bit longer, and there they also reported a 10% mortality. So this is a contemporary problem that we should not neglect. And please, when you see this slide, please be also aware that uh, three-fourths of the patients who were included in these publications had adenocarcinoma, and only 20 to 25% had squamous cell cancers. And usually the mortality rate is much higher in squamous cell cancer patients. When we go to quality of life, the French study compared with the Spitzer index, the quality of life between definitive chemoradiation and the surgical approach. 
please be aware, aware that patients who undergo esophagectomy really struggle between the first one or two years. And this is clearly shown her that in the surgery arm, it takes a while before quality of life gets back to the level where the definitive chemoradiotherapy group is. And when you go more into details, here's some work from the Netherlands in some functions like physical functioning or fatigue, uh, the scores never restore to the pre-esophagectomy level. This is different when we look at chemoradiation, where in these data from the SCOPE-1 trial from the UK, it was clearly shown that global quality of life, physical functioning, role functioning, emotional functioning, uh, suffers a bit during chemoradiation, but then restores to pre-radio chemotherapy levels. So strong arguments for chemoradiation. Was the treatment regimen correct? cisplatin 5 if you and 60 grays. Let me talk about these 60 grays because this is probably wrong what was given there. There is an old study from the US intergroup 0123 that compared chemoradiation with 54 gray versus 64.8 gray and you can easily depict from the kaplan meyer survival curves that the higher radiation dose was not associated with improved survival. There were some flaws in this old study Study. So it's reassuring that at this year's ESCO meeting, the colleagues from China showed a similar study implementing intensity modulated radiotherapy with exactly the same result. The higher dose of 60 gray had no difference in terms of local progression-free survival, progression-free survival, and overall survival as compared to the 50 gray dose. So we can conclude chemoradiation with a dose of 50.4 gray remains standard for definitive treatment, no evidence of benefit for dose escalation beyond 50 gray. Concerning the accompanying chemotherapy, I refer to the French study that compared cisplatin and Folfox, and you can easily see that Folfox had no <laughs> advantages in this trial, also not regarding uh, toxicity and quality of life issues. And with the addition of newer compounds like cetuximab, nothing got uh, better. So the conclusion here is chemotherapy <coughs> with cisplatin and 5 of you plus radiotherapy of 50 gray remained standard. Please be aware that in RTOG, they used cisplatin and paclitaxel as a backbone. But if you look at the two years and three years survival rates, it's also not better than with the older regimen. So I would not follow the argument that nowadays we absolutely have to use platin and taxane for this setting. Last point, very short, how to treat local recurrence. Be <coughs> aware that the patient I showed you, she had local tumor recurrence or persistence. And again, let's go back uh, to the ESMO guidelines. And please be aware, when you go to the series of neoadjuvant chemoradiation with contemporary regimens, the patients achieve between 30 and 50% complete response. In the cross study for the subgroup of patients with esophageal squamous cell cancer, it was 48% histopathologically confirmed complete response with neoadjuvant chemoradiation. Isn't it absurd to operate on half of the patients who have already achieved a histopathological complete response? Just think about it if it's not smarter to see if this um, complete response remains stable and reserve surgery for those who are locally progressive. And this is what we also recommend as one option in the ESMO guidelines, definitive chemoradiation, surveillance, option of salvage surgery if there is local progression. And there is emergent evidence that this could be done. This is a very interesting study from Christophe Mariette's group and from the French, French network, the Frigat, who compared patients who underwent salvage surgery for esophageal cancer with those who underwent planned surgery after neoadjuvant chemoradiation. This is not a prospective randomized controlled trial. This is an analysis from a network registry, but you can see that in terms of hospital mortality, three-year disease-free survival and overall survival, there was no difference between these groups, only anastomotic leak rates were higher in the salvage uh, uh, surgery group. So this could be a strong argument for waiting with surgery, at least for a subgroup of patients, but be aware that high mortality was reported in low versus high volume centers for salvage surgery and higher mortality was reported when the radiation dose was beyond 55 gray. 
Uh, a recent publication from the Lancet Oncology just uh, put online shows us how to select patients for a salvage surgery approach with a clinical response uh, evaluation six weeks and 12 weeks post chemo radiation involving endoscopy, bite on bite biopsy, endosonography, fine needle aspiration of suspicious lymph nodes, and PET CT. And based on this knowledge, two randomized uh, controlled trials are now run running one in the Netherlands, which is called the Sano trials, one in France, which is called the Isostrat trials. I will not go into details, but just make you aware that the concept of salvage surgery is investigated. So my summary is definitive chemoradiation is a recommended standard in the ESMO guidelines. Cisplatin 5 EFU and 50.4 gray has the best evidence. There is no evidence for higher radiation doses. Salvage surgery for local recurrence is an option to be done in highly experienced expert centers and, if possible, in ongoing phase two, phase three clinical trials. Thank you for your kind attention.